2020, uh, the famous year of uh, COVID lockdowns, um, if my me- recollection hits me right, um, around March or so is when it started to get serious. And even then, if you didn't have COVID, you still may not have known. And there's a point where you, not you, uh, but other people may not have even known anybody with COVID yet. And so it was conspiratorial. Why are they shutting down churches? And is this a government takeover? But it hit you from the very beginning, right? So what what was your experience there? Yeah, we we were um, going along just like everybody else with uh, getting word in late March that all the shutdowns were happening. All of Fresno County, all of the area where we live was shutting down and and. Um, of course, we'd never seen anything like this uh, taking place. So we, we you know, uh, stayed at home for the most part, but I still had some errands that I needed to run. And so I was running a few errands and uh, my wife had been really uh, sick with uh, a heart condition and she was actually on a heart monitor. So at night, they she was on this 24-7 She kept blacking out and having all kinds of problems, and it was simultaneous with um, COVID breaking out. And so um, in early April, she went to Kaiser uh, to have a pacemaker put in. And when she did, uh, it was an emergency. She had to get in there, get the pacemaker, uh, because she kept blacking out, and they were very concerned. So she went in and they put her, this is at the very early stage of COVID, so there were no protocols in place. And so they put her in the ER right next to a guy who evidently had COVID, and all it was was a little paper curtain separating them. And this guy was hacking up a lung. I mean, it was was terrible, terrible. Um, she didn't think anything of it, went in, got her pacemaker, came home a couple days later, and then started running some fever, which we thought had to do with the pacemaker. So we contacted the hospital. Um, she kept getting worse. And then I started getting sick, and we realized this had nothing to do with the pacemaker. And indeed, she had gotten COVID from probably that guy in the ER. And then uh, brought it home, and there were a total of nine people in our family um, that got COVID during that time. And myself and my wife were the worst cases. She she actually had it just as bad as me. She should have been in the hospital right there next to me. So you both get COVID in a bad way. And yeah. how was yours different that you end up in the hospital and, and she did it? Well... Like I said, we were both really sick, but mine, I was so weak that I literally can, I had to, I had to crawl to the restroom. I mean, I, I didn't even have the strength to walk. Um, and I was just so weak when people would call and check on me, my voice, uh, it was just a whisper and, and I was labored in my breathing and I ate all over my body. That's one of the symptoms of COVID. I mean, it, it just felt like my bones were were full of 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 uh, pain and agony, and it, it was just excruciating throughout my body. We were running fever. We were uh, we were both throwing up. We we just had horrible horrible symptoms. But mine got so bad. And so weak, and I I believe the reason that I got weaker than my wife was because she forced herself to eat and drink during the time, and um, I'm a terrible patient, and uh, I refused to drink anything. It just didn't taste good, couldn't eat anything, couldn't keep anything down, and so um, so I got sicker quicker and and deeper than she did i lost all my strength and finally ended up where the uh my son actually called kaiser and said something's going on he's he's not good please call check on him they did and within literally 30 seconds of being on the phone with me 
they asked for my wife and they said, you got to get him to the ER. Of course, we both got COVID, so nobody could take us. And uh, we, we didn't want to expose them. So we called uh, an ambulance and I went by ambulance there. And um, yeah, they admitted me uh, into the ER about one in the afternoon on April the 9th. Okay. And you end up on the ventilator, which I may be fast forwarding, but that's not a good sign, especially in those early days, right? No, not at all. By midnight that night, which is, you know, the early morning hours of April the 10th, the doctor had um, called my wife and said, look, this is terrible. He's got um, pneumonia. Um, it's, it's, you know, COVID pneumonia, which is very dangerous. And his lungs are filling up and we've got to get him on the ventilator. It, we've got to intubate him. If we don't, he's not going to make it. And uh, she asked him, she said, what, what are the chances if we don't do it? And he said he has no chance of living. He'll be gone in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and if we do, then he has a slim chance, but slim is better than none. And at that time, we didn't know, but uh, we knew the numbers were high, but we had no idea how high. 88% in the early days of those that went on the vent never came off. Of the other 12% that did come off, only one or two out of those 12 ever made it home. And so literally when the doctor said slim chance, I had a one to 2% chance of living and ever seeing my family again. Yeah. So, so it was basically slim to none. So when they were putting yeah. me on the ventilators in those days, was it, it was really just to prolong the inevitable, wasn't it? Well, it was all the all the vent did was give you a fighting chance and keep you alive long enough that hopefully they could work it out of your body, out of your your system, and that um, you know all it did was buy you time, right? And um, not much of it for most people. So, why did they put you in an induced coma? Well, when they put you on the vent. And I was in such organ failure. All of my organs were shutting down. My liver had shut down. My kidneys had shut down. Of course, my lungs uh, were filling up. And then, and then my heart was racing to try to keep up with the rest of my body. So I was in multiple organ failure. And so they put me in the induced coma, the deep coma, because they had to put me in the prone position, which is face down. Uh, 16 hours at a time. And when you're face down uh, for that amount of time, and the reason they put you face down, by the way, is because it frees up your lungs a little bit, helps you breathe a little better. And so literally the only thing keeping me alive was the machine. And uh, they put me in the coma because if you're awake, it's excruciating pain. And uh, with the, the ventilator and the tube down your throat, and then, of course, they also um, literally restrained my arms and my legs to the bed because it's very, very dangerous that if your arms are free, and even when you're in the coma, by, by just your sheer reaction, you're going to reach up and try to pull the tube. And there have been many, many cases around the country where people pulled the tube because they weren't restrained and they ended up dying. And so they had me fully restrained, laying there in that deep coma for uh, 10 days. I have no recollection. I was actually on the vent for 14 days, uh, but 10 of those days I was in a coma and I have virtually no memory. I have just a couple of memories from that time. So what was going on outside of the coma, uh, outside of the hospital room with your wife, with your family? You're the pastor, head pastor of a church. What was going on with your church all around? Well, my wife and I have a policy, and it is this, that we, um, we narrow the troops. We surround the wagons, so to speak, whenever we're going through crisis. And so she had not announced anything on Facebook. People knew I was in the hospital and that I had covid but they had no idea it was on a ventilator. Nothing was out. That was only privileged information with a few core 
uh, family members and friends from around the nation. People that we knew would pray. Um, my wife knew that that's how we operate. And so we did that. And um, my sons and my uh, daughter-in-laws, my grandkids, everybody was, of course, freaking out. And um, uh, it was it was a hard time. You know, I have one son that was in Nashville and uh, lives there. And so it was really hard on him and his family being so far away. And then uh, even my other two sons and their families being right here, uh, you know, in our backyard, so to speak, um, you know, being that close and you still can't go to the hospital, you can't see uh, your loved ones. It was it was a terrible, terrible time. After 10 days in a coma, how did you come out or did they uh, take you out of it? And what was, the, you know, what was the purpose for that? What happened next? Dude, it was, it was amazing. It was miraculous because, um, on that Friday prior to me waking up, I woke up on the, uh, 10th of, of April and on the 8th of April on that Friday, the doctors called my wife and they said, listen, we've done everything we can. There's nothing we can do. He's not going to make it. And my wife had felt like she'd heard the voice of God actually speak to her and say, he's going to live and not die. And I'm going to get glory out of this. And so she talked to the doctor um, with my family. He had all the family gathered on a phone call and said, he's just not going to make it. And uh, by the way, this was a Hindu doctor. And so he's not a man of, of like faith uh, in any way, shape or form. And he's just stating the facts and, and he's thinking my wife is delusional because she's not accepting this. And she, she finally said, look, I get it. I hear everything you're saying. I understand that my husband has no chance of living, but I need you to appease me and just tell me what has to happen for him to come off the vent. Just tell me what has to happen. So he went down this whole list. He says, kidneys are going to have to start functioning, his liver, and right on down the line, and said, but ma'am, you need to understand, your husband is not coming home. He will not make it off the ventilator. He has 24 to 48 hours to live. And so my wife is like that brave heart spirit, man. She just took off in prayer, began to gather. She announced to everyone over Facebook and she she put this um, this call out to arms, so to speak, and said, "My husband's life is in the balance, but he will live and not die. We need people to pray." And Ken, it was the most amazing thing. Over twenty thousand reports of people around the world, literally all over the world, started praying. And on that Sunday, miraculously. Um, I came out of the coma. I woke up. And uh, of course, I'm freaking out when I woke up because I, my, my, um, my recollection was just being wheeled off to ICU and they sedated me. And by the time I got to ICU, I was out when they intubated me. So I have no recollection of any of that. And um, so when I wake up, I can't move. I'm tied down. I got just a loincloth across me. I'm totally naked. I don't understand what's going on. I'm in this ice cold, you know, hospital room, all these machines on, and I feel the tube down my throat, and and uh, I don't know what's happening around me. I had no idea that it was really an answer to prayer. So you're awake you're still all hooked up. What are the doctors saying at this point that you, to your wife, that you might make it or they don't know what's happening? No, they said basically he's come out of the coma. He's awake and he's alert and he's able to answer questions, nodding his head, moving his toes. So we know that being in the coma did not cause any brain damage. They, you know, they didn't know, and I was able to follow basic commands. 
but I still was tied down, restrained, and the tube down my throat and um, and everything. And the reason that, uh, by the way, that I was naked was because the fevers were so high during those 10 days that they would pack me in ice to try to bring the, the temperature down. Sure. So that's that's why that was. But no, the doctors were still saying, look, nothing's happening. This was on Sunday. Nothing is happening. Um, he's out of the coma, but nothing has changed. But my wife and my family took that as a sign I was going to live. And uh, they just kept praying. And the next day, supernaturally, my kidneys started functioning. And they drained six liters of fluid off of my kidneys and uh and and from my lungs i mean it was it was just toxic fluid that i was literally drowning in and and out of nowhere my kidneys and my lungs started functioning and uh, the doctors were freaking out they didn't know how this was happening and of course they're reporting that to my wife and all that did was put fuel to the fire that that i was going to live and not die and you began hearing a shouting voice. <laughs> yeah. The uh, second night, so so I'm in the coma for 10 days, but I didn't come off the vent until the 14th day, the morning of the 14th day. So on day number 11, uh, that night, I'm in my room, I'm on the vent, and a nurse comes in in the middle of the night, and I hear this yelling going on. I mean, it was like thunder. It was it was just crazy. And I don't know what the deal was, but in my mind, I reasoned that there was this doctor that was in the room next to me. And maybe that room next to me was, I don't know, an office or whatever, because he was talking to somebody and he, and he just kept talking and talking and talking, but he wasn't just talking. He was yelling at the top of his lungs, and he was prophesying and making declarations over me. He was preaching um, uh, all kinds of sermons and and just amazing stuff about faith and about miracles and, and started saying, you'll live and not die, and with long life, I'm going to satisfy you, and your voice will be a voice to the world, and on and on and on. Um, all these, all these declarations, if if you will, started coming out, and to me, in my ear, it was just this muffled sound, but it was echoing, and I can't really describe it except for, you know, how you can be in a room, and next door you can hear what's going on, uh, maybe thin walls or whatever, sure, and that's how it felt, um, but that wasn't the case at all. And that went on for three nights. Three nights, over and over and over. Um, the second night, it was going on. And uh, again, I couldn't talk because I was still on the vent. And uh, nurses would come in, and I'd be looking at them like, why aren't you, how are you not hearing this? What's going on? Because they were oblivious to anything I was hearing um, to them. The room was quiet, silent, nothing. And I couldn't reason this. I couldn't understand that I was actually hearing an angel uh, at that time. I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. I just knew what I was hearing. Yeah. So th did that thought come to you later? How did you come to the conclusion? Like in well, retrospect, that would have been the voice of an angel. Yeah, it was crazy. The third day uh, that I heard it, was the day that they had removed me from the ventilator. And then that night I heard the voice again and it was continuing, echoing, same thing over and over. This time a nurse came in and I could barely talk. It was a whisper. And I said, who is that guy that just keeps yelling? And she said, what are you talking about? I said, you don't hear that? She said, uh, there's nothing going on, Mr. Wallace. It's the middle of the night. You're hearing things. And I said, no. I said, I hear you. You're talking to me. She said, yeah. 
And I said, you don't hear that echo. That I mean, it's thundering in the room. You don't hear this guy? And she said, I, I, there's nothing going on. You're hallucinating. And I looked at her and I said, are you real? And she said, well, of course. And I said, and you can't hear that. She said, I don't hear anything. So she left the room, took off all of her, you know, her mask and all the stuff. And they had helmets and gloves. And I mean, they looked like something from an alien uh, movie or something when they were coming in. And the next morning, they put me on the phone with my wife. And I was telling my wife about it, this doctor who kept yelling and prophesying and preaching. And I said, man, they're paying him to, to, you know, to be a physician, not to preach. And I can't believe this guy is really terrible. He won't shut up. And I can't even sleep because of it. And she started laughing and she said, Mark, that's not a doctor. She said, it's an angel. And she read me on the day that the doctor called and said, there's no hope. And I was still induced in the coma. There was a girl in our church who is one of our prayer warriors. I mean, this gal really sees supernatural stuff going on. And she had a vision that morning and sent it to my wife, text it to her. So we still have it all written out and said that she saw in this vision an angel standing at the foot of my bed with a sword drawn and and yelling and out of his mouth was coming all these prophetic words and all these declarations and they were landing on the walls and on the bed sheets and all over the 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 uh, medical equipment all over the floor and when it would land on the wall it was like golden words that like glitter. And the words were written out all over the walls and all over the floor. And she said, there is an angel in the room with my pastor, and he is doing warfare for his life. And um, and so I knew at that moment when my wife told me that, this is what I'd been hearing. I couldn't see any of it. I never saw the the angel, but I heard him loud and clear. And then remember now, she didn't even know that I was on the ventilator. Nobody knew at this moment that I was even on the vent until Saturday. And so, um, so when she says this, she's getting this totally in this supernatural realm. And she's getting this download is what I call it of a vision of what's really going on because men can, there's things going on in the natural And then there's the supernatural. There is a spirit realm all around us. And demons are in operation. Angels are in operation. There's warfare. There's all kinds of stuff. It's actually more real than the world that we live in and what we can see and feel. And uh, I think that, that, and in fact, I know that people are given insight and they are able to see into that realm and uh, that's what was going on with, with this, uh, we call them intercessors, but with this gal in our church. A lot of people, if they've had an experience even similar to yours, they end up um, changing their life, their careers, and they go into ministry and they become a pastor. You were a pastor. How has this yeah. affected your life since then? Well, uh, you can't go through something like I did and it not change you. Um the whole experience. You know, I went through all the things of, well, if you're a pastor, why'd you get sick? Why didn't God protect you? Why this? Why that? I I just, it has changed me and transformed the way I look at everything in life. First of all, getting a new lease on life and just, just I should be dead. Um, but that lets me know God's not done. And, and I'm not done. God's still got something that he wants to do through my life and probably greater than, than uh, all my years of ministry prior. And so um, it's changed me in that way. It's also helped me reprioritize some things. Um, you know, my whole life is ministry, always has been, but uh, family is, is taking a lot more of a front row 
seat uh, in my life and just being more present with my kids, my grandkids, my family, and and yeah, uh, I was going to ask not being locked into everything else. I was going to ask if your family would say it's it's changed you. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. They see a difference. Um, you know, when I when I came out of the hospital, I still had and I was dealing with some PTSD from all the trauma and uh, went through a little bit of therapy and everything just because it was it was just so traumatic, man. And and uh, uh, there were so many questions and so many things. And you know, when I got home, I was still suffering, feeling like in the middle of the night I was choking and I couldn't breathe and panic attacks and uh, nightmares and, um, you know, all kinds of things that were still haunting me. And then there was, honestly, it was really weird because I felt this tremendous guilt that I lived, and that's part of the PTSD. I lived, and so many people younger than me, I mean, I was 57 at the time, and uh, there were people in their 30s that were dying of of COVID and young men, young ladies who had their whole life in front of them and children. I know one guy who was actually in ministry and um, he died of COVID and his wife was pregnant with their fourth child. And, um, and here he dies. And so when I hear reports like that and I hear of that stuff, I'm, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of guilt that I lived, um, and God, why, and all of that. And so I had to sort through a lot of stuff, uh, in the midst of it. You know, people look at miracles and they think, um, oh, it's so supernatural and it's so awesome. And God just waves a magic wand and boom, something happens. My miracle was messy, man. It was messy. It was because anytime you're in a miracle, the very nature of a miracle is the fact that you're at the end of everything natural. If God doesn't show up and do something supernatural, you're going to die. Sure, you're not going to make it. And and so all of your circumstances, all of your 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 feelings, your emotions, everything is uh, is sunk into it. And so you got to sort all that out, you know, and in the miracle as well. So, yeah. We were kin I don't people. know if that answered your question. Uh, well, yeah. How did it answer your question? I mean, where did you end up? Where's an answer for you as far as if you get the guilt behind you, what's your mission? You, you get up in the morning. Do you still feel the guilt or what's your thrive for the day? No, no I, you know, through the therapy that I went through after I came out of the hospital. First of all, just coming out of the hospital uh, was miraculous. But then, and there was, I mean, I was the only person to live in all of Fresno County and come off the vent and make it home uh, for months and months and months. I think they finally got one more but um, uh, during those months. But it was a lot of fanfare, a lot of the news, a lot of all that. And and it was it was crazy a front front page of the Fresno Bee on Sunday morning and all of that, and yet when I came home, uh, they told me it'd be six to nine months before I could even operate without oxygen and without a walker, and literally in two weeks, man, I I threw the walker away. I was walking around, and within two and a half weeks, I didn't have any oxygen going on and and my my recovery was fully uh there now i still had a lot of fatigue a lot of symptoms a lot of stuff that's that's post covid but um i said that to say that during that whole year of 2020 right toward the tail end of the year um a book or nothing was on my mind it was just trying to sort through it all And um, whenever I went through the therapy, it really helped me. It helped me gain perspective. It helped me uh, look at everything from a different angle. And uh, I didn't have any nightmares anymore. I wasn't waking up with panic attacks. And then around December of 2020, I went into this deep reflection of life and just began to kind of 
take everything I believed, all of my priorities, everything going on in my life, and kind of jump up and down on it, if you will, to see if it would hold me. And my doctrine, my theology, what I believed about God and who He is and and how I could best serve Him the rest of my life. And and so uh, it was a month of major, major reflection there around the holidays. And I'd say about mid-January, I came out of that reflective time just more resolve, more ambition, more more um, uh, determination that I was going to fulfill the plan of God on my life and that, that I had lived because he had a plan for my life and he wasn't done with me and I wasn't done. And so uh, I kind of mapped that whole thing out. My wife and I started another 501c3 nonprofit where I'm pouring into pastors and I'm doing things. I'm still pastoring our church, of course, but but now I'm I'm really mentoring and and coaching, if you will, a lot of pastors around the country. And this whole new realm of ministry has opened up for me, um, uh, where I can help them. Nice. Where can people find your your book? Uh, they can log on. It's only on the internet. I do not have it on uh, Amazon right now. I've, I've I've felt not to do that yet. Um, but it's uh, at the website. I'm not done. Dot online, and uh, there's no punctuation in that. So the little after the I and it's lowercase across. Uh, just I'm not done. Dot online, and they can get my book there. And uh, it's really cool because. At that website, there's also a QR code in the back of the book, or you can go on the website and you can look at the gallery, and it shows all the pictures of everything we went through, and it puts it in timeline with the pages in the book so that uh, everything's correlated and people can actually get a visual of what I'm talking about in the book. So Good. Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll leave a link in the notes. All right. Thank you, uh, Pastor Mark. It's amazing. I appreciate your time. Hey, God bless. Thanks, man.